Next, we are going to learn how to visualize large discrete data. Consider the following data set obtained by recording the presidential ages at inauguration. Will we run into any issues if we try to treat this large discrete data set same way as if it was small? If we do that, we would end up with the following frequency table and the following histogram. The problem with such summaries is that when more than half of the frequencies are zeros and ones, the summary isn't very informative. To deal with this issue, we first group the observations into classes, also known as categories or bins, and then treat each class as a distinct value. Each class is defined by a range of values from the lower class limit up to but not including the upper class limit. We define the lower class limit as the smallest value that could go into the class, and the upper class limit as the lower class limit of the next higher class. We define the class midpoint as the average of the lower limit of the class and the upper limit of the class, and we also define the class width as the difference between the lower limit of the class and the upper limit of the class. Note that because of all the formulas that relate the quantities, we only need two of the four of them to define the entire class structure. For example, if the lower class limit is 15 and the class width is 10, then the classes are from 15 to 25, from 25 to 35, from 35 to 45, and from 45 to 55, etc. Also note that each value can only belong to one class. For example, the value 35 will belong to the class labeled from 35 to 45 and not to the class labeled from 25 to 35. And finally, the sample size determines the number of classes in the following way. We're going to use the following guideline for choosing the classes. First, we're going to decide on the approximate number of classes using the table from the previous slide. Next, we're going to calculate an approximate class width using the given formula. Then we'll use this result to decide on a convenient class width. Then we'll choose a number for the lower limit of the first class, noting that it must be less than or equal to the minimum observation in the data set. We'll obtain the other lower class limits by successively adding the class width chosen in step 2 to the lower class limit found in step 3. And then we'll use this result to specify all the classes. Let's take another look at our data before we decide how to split it into classes. Using the step-by-step -step procedure for choosing the classes, we decide that the number of classes should be between 7 and 14. To calculate the approximate class width, we obtain the range by subtracting the smallest value from the largest value and dividing it by a number between 7 and 14, which approximately will give us a nice number 5 when the number of classes is chosen to be 7. We choose the lower limit of the smallest class to be 40, as it is a very nice round number that is less than the smallest value in the data set. We obtain the other lower class limits by adding the class width 5 to the lowest uh, lower class limit 40. And we get 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, 65, and 70. We use these results and specify all the classes 40 to 45, 45 to 50, 50 to 55, 55 to 60, from 60 to 65, from 65 to 70, and from 70 to 75. Once we identify the classes, we can start the tally by assigning each value to one of the classes. The first value, 57, is between 55 and 60, so it belongs to the fourth class. The next value, 61, is between 60 and 65, so it belongs to the fifth class. 
the value 57 again is between 55 and 60, so it belongs to the fourth class, and so on. Now we can count the frequencies and the total and use it to compute the relative frequencies. Basically once the classes are created we can construct a relative frequency distribution table for large discrete data in exactly the same way we did it earlier for small discrete data. And once we have a complete frequency table we can now construct a frequency histogram. Similarly, we can obtain the relative frequency histogram. Once the idea of grouping is understood, the process of constructing the frequency or relative frequency table and the histogram is very intuitive. In summary, to construct a frequency table for large discrete data, we first list the classes in the first column of the table. Then for each observation, we place a tally mark in the second column of the table in the row corresponding to the appropriate class. Then we count the tallies for each class and record the totals in the third column of the table. For relative frequencies tables, we also compute the relative frequencies in the fourth column. Also, to construct a histogram or a relative histogram for large discrete data, we first obtain a frequency or relative frequency distribution table of the data then we draw a horizontal axis on which we place the bars and the vertical axis on which we display the frequencies or relative frequencies. And then for each class, we construct a vertical bar whose height equals to the frequency or the relative frequency of that class. We at the end label the bars with the classes, the horizontal axis with the name of the variables and the vertical axis with the frequency or relative frequency. While it may appear that we used different approaches to organize small and large discrete data, they both can be described by the term grouping. Single value grouping for small discrete data and interval grouping for large discrete data. The two methods have more in common than it appears at first sight, because the single value grouping can be viewed as an interval grouping with each single value x defining a class of width 1 and acts as the middle point. We discussed how to organize large discrete data and concluded that essentially it is the same way as we organize qualitative and small discrete data with additional step uh, called binning or creating classes.